Just a moment. That sounds like us, and we're live. Yeah, we good. Greg Johnson, welcome aboard. Thanks, man. Hey, um, you were just talking about Memphis right then, so let's just continue this conversation sure. because um, you're one of those iconic Kiwi artists. I kind of think about you, and I think about the Finns, and I think about the Dobbins, and I think about that kind of that kind of they're your classmates for want of a better word. Honored to be in their company as well. Yeah, that's and and been around without um, disrespect on age, but forever and a day. Oh yeah, totally. Played every <laughs> played every location. I think I saw you at the Mungify Pub once. You played Mungify Pub? Yeah. Back in the back in the nineties? Yeah, probably with exponents or Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or... I think that might have been it actually. Yeah. Yeah. So one of those awesome Kiwi music stories that Just done everything, been everywhere. True, yeah. But but since the last fifteen years you've been in the US? Yeah, I moved in two thousand two. Um, and uh, been there ever since although obviously i get back uh, at least once a year and do things here and i've still got friends and family here so i kind of come back and like almost like a tourist and i i have to say it's it's been i love coming back now because we usually tour around so yeah. i feel like i'm getting a paid vacation around so do you kind of do you, do you come back and do a tour or when you say tour around just visiting spots oh usually a tour yeah. so a tour a year in new zealand pretty much yeah and we'll do i mean it may be that we don't go everywhere but um and sometimes we come back and do just private shows for right, you know. But um, yeah, this time this time around we're doing deep south and some spots we missed in the North Island in November, and then heading to Australia. So, so I can see, yeah, there's your uh, Greg Johnson Music yeah, dot com. Yeah. So you've got like five locations in New Zealand. Is that would that be a big tour? No, that's that's kind of the end of what we did. Uh, started in November on this tour, and that that first half we did. Um, did Littleton and Wellington and Hamilton and a festival in Hawke's Bay and a few in Auckland and just generally um, here and there. And this this time we were just sort of picking up places we didn't get to last time, or some of them. Yeah. And so if people are watching this live stream, um, you're in Invercargill tonight and then Queenstown, Palmerston, North, New Plymouth, Auckland over the next week, yeah. two weeks. Yeah, that's right. And then off to Australia. Yeah, and then back to the states. Yeah, is that the plan? That is the plan. So, what was the what was it was? Did you move to uh, America for music, for love, for just a change of scene? What was it about? Well, I'd I'd been um, playing shows there for the last the, the two years prior to moving, and with the express aim of trying to sign to an American label and to get things going up there, and um, actually signed to a label in two thousand two, uh, an indie label that was run by. Some of the Fleetwood Mac people, Richard mm. Bashit and Ken Calais, and why they're producers? Is that right? Producers, yeah. yeah. And um, and part of the deal was, you know, you can't be on the label if you're not in the country. So we had, we moved, and um, I was ready for a change by then too. It was you know um, something I'd been wanting to do anyway. So yeah, that was what happened. And for the first couple of years, toured a lot around the states, did a lot of um, promo stuff. Um, yeah. The label collapsed within six months of being there. Oh, no. We spent uh, a lot of money, with, didn't achieve very much because they, they just were sort of in chaos, actually, at that point. The whole industry was in a kind of chaos, I think. The whole digital world had not yet... So this is when... the Yeah, okay, so the Spotify's and the... All those things weren't really happening yet, and... Um, Napster Nap was around? Napster was probably just collapsed at that point. Right. And so... Uh, what happened essentially was that that company realized that the kind of music I was doing was needed to cross over to, uh, you know, adult contemporary is what, what they call it. Well, your music is, is interesting because you seem to have a feather in several caps. I do, yeah, yeah. So what um, would you, if someone said to you, what kind of music do you play? How would you answer that today? Today I'd say just melodic stories. Right. Really? And I wasn't at the gig last night, but I hear really good things about it. You do literal storytelling as well? You kind of uh, have a chat while yeah, you're playing yeah. and that? This tour is, um, is a kind of, uh, it's a little, bit of, a little bit of background on the tunes as well. Because right. people, people are, are my, particularly my audience, are kind of interested in that stuff. And so I give a little background on each, um, each tune and maybe how it was written or why it was written or what, it's, what my angle on that song is. Mm. Um, and we throw up some images moving and stills behind us related to each tune as well sometimes um abstract other times quite literal or pictures from the sessions or whatever mm. people seem to enjoy that and um yeah so the stories are are both sung and told mm. yeah 
that might, that's that so it's it's more than and i don't mean just a concert in a negative way but it's bigger than just well, going yeah. to hear a singer songwriter there's actually yeah information and stories and storytelling yeah, along the definitely. way i mean that's always been a part of my show anyway um is uh, you know i don't just go up there and play 20 songs and, and go thank you in between each one. Oh, well, you know i like to engage with the audience and yeah. i like to see what they what they think about stuff and and um that's part of the whole thing. It needs to be for my my kind of. That's that's the, the way I like music. I like to be close, um, and my songs suit small venues really, which is lucky because you know that's all. Really, <laughs> <laughs> that's all the tickets we can sell. I um I I agree with you though. I I've been to see a few bands, and although it's always great to see a big band yeah, live, yeah, when you could have put on a CD and got the exact same. Uh, audible experience you mm-hmm. kind of sometimes go what's the point mm-hmm. so it's really nice to have you know people engage the the artists engage i love it yeah i i think so um i mean that's yeah that's that's the background i'm from um and i to be quite honest if occasionally we do a festival or something where we're on a big out, outdoor stage or something and i, I <coughs> feel quite lost I, I don't really know how to re- relate to people that are 100 feet away so you like standing. that intimacy yeah I, yeah i like them right in the face you know i, I <laughs> You know, I I grew up in um, in playing in little shitty sort of rock and roll clubs with you know, tiny rooms, and then then did the whole jazz thing for years, where I was singing in little clubs with uh, with the audience literally in your face. Mm. And um, I like that. You know, I like the I like the I like to see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it also must give you a good uh, sort of response. It's like you always hear about the things comedians like when they're on stage is they know if they've done well because they hear that and they hear laughing. If you can see them right there, that must be a similar thing for a yeah, that's musician. Very, yeah, it is true. It's very true. So um, that's what happens. I mean, I'd like to say I could play stadiums and make a whole lot of money, but uh, it's just not It's not what I do. So so life that. life in Memphis, so Tennessee, so the Deep South. Um, well, my wife's from there. I right. live in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. So that's what I was going to say. I had friends who were in a band in, yeah. in um, Nashville. And they said the life was very different over there. Yeah. So she's from Memphis, but you're residing in California. That's correct. And yeah. as, as for a Kiwi living in there, especially in this kind of geopolitical time with all the, <laughs> you know, all the worldwide news uh, of the political scene over there, is it a is it a fun life? Is it interesting? It's, is it? It's what? tiring, but you know, um, in that sense. But I always uh, sort of had an attitude that I think where would where would the most interesting place to have been? be in the Rome during the Roman Empire or something like that and was like well probably Rome yeah it's true and um, and I, I get the I sort of have that sense about things at the moment but uh, it, it's a very it's a lot of things Los Angeles people have a lot of misconceptions about that city I think um, you could visit LA and a lot of people do a lot of Kiwis do particularly they'll go they'll take the kids to Disneyland and they'll stay in Anaheim and yeah and they'll drive to maybe down Hollywood and 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 think, oh, this is kind of awful. <laughs> and you know, it is. Anaheim's pretty pretty fucking boring. But um, well, we live right in the city near near Venice and Santa Monica. Oh, nice. And you pay for that. I mean, we live in a box um, that we pay a lot for. But um, your life is right there. You know, everything's on foot. Um, pretty much three hundred and. 50 days a year you can walk outside with just a t-shirt on head, head to muscle beach <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> do, right. do a few reps yeah i mean it's 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 interesting it's always been a very um uh what's the word i suppose um a creative place and also a place where ideas start and that, that santa monica um venice is, is what the bohemian section a bit more a bit more creative but more you know it always different had, people it always has been e- e- even venice you know the guy that started uh, the whole idea of the canals this guy called abbott kinney mm. um he was a revolutionary in the day he did this in the late uh, i guess 1890s start all that stuff and he all along he wanted to integrate he wanted black people white people people from everywhere and at a time when that was completely mm. a f- fucking radical idea you know <laughs> Um, and he, he built this dream there and, and to an extent that it's always been like that. Um, it's kind of the California stamp in some ways, but it's also a lot of other things and the real creative, the young musical creative areas are no longer West Side at all. They, they tend to be Echo Park and Silver Lake and some of the other, other suburbs inland, um, a little bit cheaper rents and, right, yeah. you know, uh, if you were 20, you wouldn't move to 
Santa Monica you couldn't afford it for a start right. and there's no music clubs down there that you'd want to go to so right. you'd move to um, La Humbra or one of the old suburbs that's that's sort of you know gentrifying rapidly probably do, old Latino do you have like a, is there like a Kiwi expat community over there at all like I there mean is, I see a lot of actors young actors Kiwi actors mm-hmm. sort of heading off there and you see their Instagram accounts with the musos and stuff do you have peers over there from back in New Zealand um, not so much musical people but um, yeah there, there is a community um, they have a Christmas party every year at Santa Monica Airport and I won the seafood lot the seafood pack three hundred dollars <laughs> worth of uh, wholesale New Zealand seafood and nice. we drove out to the Good old sort of RSA style oh. meat pack <laughs> <laughs> exactly mate and I'll tell you what the seafood is so expensive over there and to, to have that when we drove out to um, to their warehouse in the middle of some some giant kind of warehouse district and uh, the son was actually a, the ex uh, his mother was his mother and father were Kiwis but he was born there but he still had a bit of a Kiwi kind of angle and he was like oh bring in all these things and, oh how you want some of those we ended up with so much amazing Fresh stuff that was obviously just off the plane, you know. Yeah. So there's that. There's um, yeah. There is a base a basis of of Kiwis built around a couple of Kiwis in LA as the club, and um, we go to the occasional event. But other than that, it's um, you know, you're just another person. There's nothing particularly interesting about any particular group. But everyone's there, you know. Um, it's a sort of city where people probably don't even run into there's probably this i think the largest afghan community outside of afghanistan really there's a hundred thousand afghans in la wow mm. what's there's, the total population is four or five million the city greatest city is about nine eight, right. eight or nine but the uh, heading south it, it just sort of blends into orange county and yep. then and then into uh san diego and encinitas and all those places just continuous city the whole way um so it's on that urban sprawl. It's where they're just, just yeah. It's just it just goes and goes and goes and goes. Um, and so, in a, in a broad sense, you know, it, you have to find a neighborhood. It's a real mm. neighborhood place. I right. guess Chicago's like that as well. I think. But um, yeah, it's it's a good place. The the weather is 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 just unbeatable as far as I'm concerned. And the sunshine makes me happy. Well, it's not bad here today. Today no. is like I've brought this with me. <laughs> I feel. Thank you. We do appreciate that. <laughs> it's awesome. Hey, um, it's interesting talking about things like Napster and Spotify. I've got a friend, actually, these guys in Nashville, and he jokingly said to me the other day, if we go away, well, I, t- I told him I was going away for the weekend. He said, oh, put one of our songs on Rotate on Spotify. And if you go away for two and a half days, by the time you get back, we might have earned enough for about half a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> I thought of that. <laughs> well, the streaming has probably cost more. <laughs> yeah, possibly. But I'm, I was wondering i mean your full-time gig is music yeah it always has been always but, has been but always uh, a variety of f- things within music um i've got a little studio uh 10 blocks from from our apartment uh, a room that's it's not a big room but it's a nice little room and i do i produce the odd okay. singer songwriter and um record bits and bobs i do soundtracks some soundtrack um just doing a film just almost finished on a film uh a new zealand uh, couple of guys w- uh, have done a documentary on the wine industry and the history oh, yeah. of new zealand wine industry and um doing that kind of thing is uh kind of the day job you know in some ways these days but all your all your income for want of a less gratuitous word is based around music always has been yep um I'm completely unemployable in any other capacity. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to a young young fella or fella S today coming up in the industry, whereas it would seem that in days gone by, you know, being successful, you could live off your album sales and your radio airplay, where it seems now to be successful, meaning financially successful, it's all about touring. Is that a, uh, That's the assumption that most people say. Is that fair? And so how do you have to approach music differently today from, you know, right. 30 years ago? Well, I mean, I've always toured and um and tours like these tours that i'm doing at the moment will be a portion of my yearly income Mm -hmm. and i think uh, it is difficult these days but it always was difficult Mm -hmm. the difference being that back in the day if you could land a a especially a major label deal you know uh, you might get a check from emi for eighty thousand dollars and I wasn't this, I wasn't as smart as I should have been with some of those. <laughs> I should really have bought equipment and held on to that rather than spending it at other people's places and blowing it on uh, fun. 
You mean like producing yourself rather than paying someone else to produce Yeah, I think a lot of the the very smart people probably back in the day that got those big advances were, would have bought equipment for themselves. And And then then you've got an income to Mm. other people as well. Yeah, and also something tangible that you can... Although we were just, me and Jace were just talking, it's very different today. I don't know why Daniel Bedingfield came up, but we were talking about, you know, he seems to be one of the first people in the early 2000s that made a worldwide hit recording on a mic in his bedroom. Yeah, that's right. You know? It uh, is different, exactly. You're right. Yeah, the, so, so the technology is hugely I mean, what, different. What we've got in here, this, the, the, the cameras and the mics and stuff, this, this competes, I'm not saying the content, <laughs> but certainly the <laughs> so, quality of the sound and look totally. with any television station absolutely. in the country. Absolutely. And, for and a fraction of the cost. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's also been an interesting byproduct of the digital age is this explosion of television and streaming and Netflix mm. and Amazon and all this stuff. There's so much TV being made now that uh, it all needs music. And ah, that's interesting because I was going to say, so do you lose opportunity because everyone can do it themselves, but there sounds like what you're saying is there's more opportunity to, I, to I fill. I think so. I think so, yeah. I think ah. the sync possibilities are huge. Obviously, the fees and depending on the shows are not as big as they once were. But um, Unless you're Dave Chappelle. Well, yeah, exactly. And you get $60 million for three things you've already done. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, there are always exceptions. And you know, it's interesting watching some of the old classic bands sort of trucking out their catalogues. Um, so that's a that's always been a part of it as well, you mm. know, sync and and also music music to score and um, commercials. Managed to, to land uh, "Don't Wait Another Day" in a in a um, AA Health commercial a couple of years back, and you know those kind of things can make for a good year. You yeah, just look at like you know um, Dave Bax with Everline City and his love, 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 New World pretty much bought that song out, right? And I'm sure he's bought a house off of just New World using it in their advertising. Quite New likely, World supermarket, yeah. you know. Perhaps, yeah, but he's in, garage, D- Dave's but, interesting. Yeah, he's interesting because he's probably one of the you know Silver Scroll winner, much like yourself. Um, Which Dave we're talking about? Dave Bax from Avalanche City. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I think now I, I'm happy to be corrected, and and he's doing a tour shortly. He's not unfortunately coming to Dunedin, but I I. Th- think he still has other income streams outside of music um i'm happy to be corrected there but it seems to be if you don't have like yourself your finger in many pies and this might be the same for any kind of arts category actually especially in new zealand writers you yeah. know actors whatever you need to have the backups for those quiet touring years or that those two years in a row you don't have a top 10 hit or whatever oh yeah it it's you know it's look it's a constant challenge i have to say and um you know, my wife and I split the rent, luckily, because she makes more money than me. Um, but, you know, I think it's always been challenging to keep to keep the ball rolling. And, and, you know, you can have a period of time where you, you are making good money off of hits and, or, or radio or whatever. Not so much radio now, but um, that dries up. It does, and you know the, the royalty checks get progressively smaller and smaller. Well, let, let's just talk about this because you know? my my daughter said to me the other day about how she wanted to be an actress, right? And I'm like, awesome, amazing. You mm-hmm. should you should think about that. And we talked all the way through it, and I said to her, "Do you reckon you're the best actor in your school?" Mm-hmm. And she went, "No." And I said, "Do you think the person who is the best actor in your school is possibly the best actor in Dunedin?" And I went, no. And I said, "So I was, what I was trying to do is saying chase your dreams, but have some re, you know some mm-hmm. some look at that as well." Mm-hmm. And um. Uh, I just completely went blank on what we were just talking about. We were talking, you just, what did you just say we were just talking about? Uh, uh, I've gone blank as well. Cutting the rent. Oh, yes. Finding finding alternate sources of income. Alternate sources. Following your passion, following the arts, but finding the way to commercialize. The arts. I wanted to, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to ask you, without getting into your personal financial details, about when you say the money's good. So I know someone who wrote a book, Mm -hmm. took him three, four years to write a book. A factual based book mm-hmm. became the number one bestseller in New Zealand. Um, sold 10, 15, 20,000 copies. He gets in his hand about a dollar a copy. So, four or five years work on this For book. 20 or 30 grand. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so obviously, I'm not interested in your personal stuff, but when you say good money in New Zealand music, what, well, how does it work? What are we well, talking? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm obviously not at the top of that scale. I'm sure the 660 have just sold out massive bloody stadiums of actually making real, yeah. mo- they're making real money there. Playing here tomorrow night. Buying houses kind of money. Yeah, cool. I'm talking about just surviving. You know, we've got no assets. It's an interesting one um, because. I've, I've sort of I put it like this to people who were talking about you know retirement funds and all this shit. It's like, well, I, we haven't. I don't have anything. And I live day to day. There's no bank account with money. There's no houses. There's nothing. We just live, pay the rent, and survive, and live a good lifestyle. But I say that the difference is 
as a young man, and all through my 20s, 30s, 40s, I did exactly as I liked. I never right. had a boss. No one told me what to do. We traveled the world. We've, I've lived this great life. Now, at the other end, uh, I won't have a big fun to go traveling or a nice house to, you know, or any of that stuff. But I think the payoff is so I'm kind of at the, 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 the sort of raw end of it now, I suppose. Mm. But the payoff was, um, you know, my best years. I, I was a free artist. I did whatever I liked, you know. Like you can't, I wasn't, you know, uh, working in some office for some people I didn't even know or care about. Because yeah, you know, so. people spend, you know, they spend their entire life in an office working yeah. and then when they retire they go have their fun. Whereas, you Well, know, and, and of course what happens a lot of times is that, the, you know, Fred, Fred's got a million dollars there and they're going to set off on their first class traveling jobs dead carcass, on the first yeah. bloody trip. He's dead on the... And, and, you know, that's been a bit negative, but it does happen. And also, you know... Um, I mean, I, I'm justifying my own existence here, but but um, I don't think I'd change that necessarily. I don't think I could have done something for other people. So looking life. looking back on your life, then um, you've done it how you wanted to do it, and you wouldn't change anything. Well, so uh, you you'd know, rather you'd rather have the smaller bank account and bigger life, if I can put it that way. Yeah, I think that is true, and yeah. I'm not to say I wouldn't change things because I think I w I, w I would have made different decisions, uh, right, and musical decisions right. here and there. Um, I think my own stubbornness has had stifled a lot of opportunities. And I, you only know, realise that in post as well. But um, certainly if I'd played more of the game, I think we could. I could have had a bigger bank account. But um, maybe I wouldn't be so so pleased or proud of my own back catalogue then. Maybe I'd be, you know, feel a bit dirty. So <laughs> you, you, you get the personal conviction of you having a happy life and making, I, I'm, I was going to say moral decisions, I don't know what the decisions you're talking about, but decisions that are right for you yeah. versus, and I'm going to use that horrible phrase, what some people would say is selling out and, and playing the game for the sake of the yeah. almighty dollar. Yeah, I think so. You know, um, example is I had a band, which was really quite a kicking sort of band in Los Angeles with a couple of English gentlemen and Ted Brown. And it was a great, pretty rocky sounding band. And we were going completely in the wrong direction, just as everything was heading into folk and picking noodly acoustic, which I enjoy, and I could have done, but no one was going to tell me that, that, that that's what I should do. You know, at that point, I was I know I've got my band that I like, and we're doing that. So, uh, I guess the other thing though is there's probably no guarantees that if you had have changed direction, well, there are, that would have been necessarily financially successful. There are or no there anyway. are no guarantees whatsoever, and and every time some you know, someone with a real business mind comes into yep. the music. They say, oh, let's, let's have a look at music. Where's Maybe the we, gap? They look at it and they go, this is insane. I've got to spend a million dollars and there's no guarantees. I'll probably lose all of it. Yeah. What the? You know, <laughs> forget it. I'll go and invest in uh, growing peas or you know, nectarines. Or you just talked about picking the guitar. Me and Jason have a wager. And you have to settle it. Oh, mm -hmm. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. On so that. Jason thinks he knows what your we're going to call it number one guitar brand would be. In other words, the guitar that you do you have multiple guitars you use on stage? Uh, I only use one at the moment. Okay, perfect. Because yes. <laughs> we have a wager and lunch is based on it. So he, I've given him two opportunities. Okay. And he seems to think you will definitely have one of these two. All right. Brands. Let me hear this. So, do you want to tell Jace? Jace, do you want to say what your thing is, or do you want to tell us what brand? I your think guitar you should is? just tell us what it is. Okay. Got. Well, um, so your number one guitar at the moment. Right now, I'm playing a Martin. I get lunch. He said. I said Tecumini or Martin. So that means I'm, I'm, I'm no, don't like Tecuminis. The, the reason I've got a Martin is I sold this beautiful Hudson Dalton, which is a handmade guitar from Virginia, like yep. a, a beautiful five thousand dollar guitar. To pay the rent one month oh. last year, just because you know that's what happens. Yep. Sometimes I've been there. Yeah, and um, luckily I, I sold it to a cousin of mine who's who's uh, now got it. He was he paid good money for it, and, he, and I think I can play it again if I need it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Possibly even buy it back. Yeah, off I will buy it back. So but that means Jace's Jace's won that bet. Well done. Yes. That, so he picked it too. He said you'll be one of two guitars. So he well, was right. Well, uh, the reason the Mar I bought the Mar the Martin is actually one of those. It's like a it's only a thousand dollar guitar, but it's plastic, mostly plastic with a spruce top. Mm -hmm. That bloody thing stays in tune, travels really well. It's got such an even tone. I've never enjoyed playing guitar more than that one. Oh wow! Cool. And it's 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 just uh, 
you know that's technology as well it's coming into all these other areas yeah you know, I, I had that i had that I, I took my little sister guitar shopping a couple of years back because you know i had my guitar that i paid about 1500 bucks for right and rocked and walked to rock to the rock shop picked up this um that actually was a tech mini actually and it was like 400 dollars. it was a japanese made mm -hmm. tech mini mm -hmm. and it was beautiful it sounded like i loved the action on it i loved the how right. it played loved how it sounded and so the amount to be spent on a guitar doesn't matter as no, whether you like it personally exactly you know um yeah, and, and the sky's the limit for spending on that kind of shit, isn't it? I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes, hey. I remember B.B. King, I mean, sometimes it really comes down to what you what you like. B.B. King has got a quote he used to talk about when um, music was going more electric. He goes, you can't fake dusty strings. No, right. Yeah, it's, it's exactly so, right. so, you know, the, he, he liked the sound of his strings being dusty. I, I mean, as a as a mm -hmm. pleb when it comes to musical ability, I don't know what difference that would make, right. but he could hear the difference between mm -hmm. a, a guitar with dusty strings and something going through a synthesizer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, the very idea of rock and roll was based on, you know, the fact that they couldn't get a nice clean sound for the acoustic through that amp. It was it all just went all distorted and everyone said, well, if you like that better, <laughs> it's a whole new thing. Yeah. Do you think there's a change in the music industry at the moment around uh, the, the culture of offence as well? I'm really interested um, with uh, right. uh, Michael Jackson stuff over the last few oh, days. Yeah. Have you heard of any of this news? You've been keeping yeah, up with this at all? Yeah, I have. And, you know, I, I don't really have an opinion other than there seemed to be an awful lot of smoke there. And, uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> and the document. My, in my experience, where there's a lot of smoke. There's fire somewhere. So uh, the the culture of offence might be valid, obviously, with the Michael Jackson situation. The documentary is out. It's called Escaping Neverland, I think. Right. It's going to be on TVNZ, I think, leaving next week. Neverland, I've, yeah. I've been leaving Neverland. I was watching it online last night. Um, what about the idea of radio stations pulling his music? Yeah, I, I don't know. It seems like, really, is that the biggest problem we've got right now? That's half... Uh, uh, manufactured... I mean, it's not a manufactured problem if there were kids that, that would be destroyed by him. Mm. Or maybe it's not a manufactured problem if he didn't do anything and his family legacy is being uh, destroyed. I don't, I don't know. Who, how, could, how could I know? Apparently the director's come out in the last uh, couple of days, director of this documentary, saying he's he doesn't think people should be pulling music. I mean... Yeah, I wonder well, also, and, the, but, and that's what I'm saying in this this yeah. culture we've got at the moment of um, you know being offended. And I'm not saying that this, I mean, if right. this has happened, this is the appropriate thing to be offended about. But we seem to jump up, we seem to jump pretty quickly to... I, th I think it's real, I think, and it's, you know, I'm a super liberal, always have been a um, progressive person politically and everything else. But I think the left is in grave danger of, of going up its own ass with this stuff and destroying its chances of getting power back from the... F rising fascists basically uh, by basically taunting people who could go their way with you know the removal of statues and pulling things down just walk past it for fuck's sake so know? this sounds like it is something you take notice of in america oh it's very very much part of the political argument there yeah and, and, and revisionist history to me is just the most pointless thing of all i mean is was captain cook good or bad he was what he was yeah and for his time an extremely progressive person whether you like it or not, read Ann Salmon's book about Cook, The Trial of the Cannibal Dog, and you'll realize that, in fact, for his time, he was incredibly progressive and a great humanitarian and had a genuine respect for a lot of those cultures. Now, people would jump up and down and say, well, he fired bombs at the guns at the... the. And yes, he was a man of that era, yeah. and he lived in that era. And you can't go back and say... He should have done something different because we weren't there in 1765. You know? I wonder if this cult we're in, and I have to tell you, I, I keep an eye on American politics like nobody's business. Like I get up in the morning and my kids laugh at me because I turn on YouTube and they go, oh, dad, are you just checking to see whether Trump's blowing up the world yet? And I go, yep, oh, every morning I check it. It's the I, biggest show, biggest sitcom of all time. <laughs> I wonder, and I don't, I don't mean this as black and white as it sounds because I don't want to make it sound like I'm drawing this line, but I wonder if when we start to... Um, compare if we start to place our values of today on activity of 50, 30, 40, 20 years ago, we're always going to come up short. Now, if we exactly. place if we place our crimes of today, like for example, you know the Bill Cosby situation, mm -hmm. that's a crime. But if we place our moral values and our understandings today, like the words in the last couple of years that have been banned, like the word retard, for example, right. if we look back. Three years ago, and we find a celebrity who's got that all over their tweets, and place the moral judgment of today on the the acceptable, and I'm not yeah. saying good or bad, but I'm saying societally acceptable behaviour of three years ago. 
Yeah. What are we going to... We, we, and you say the left. I think the left eats their own. Oh, I agree. Well, that's what happened with James Gunn, the director of the the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. You know, he they pulled a tweet out, one tweet from like six or seven years ago, and because of the controversy around that one tweet, which I don't even think was super, super bad or anything, and it was just a bit chauvinistic, he got fired from... Disney kicked him off the movie that he yeah. built, the franchise it's, he yeah. built. It's... it's um, I don't know. If, I don't know where that stops. That's the thing. At what point do you say, well... You know, what did your great 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 grandparents do? Well, they did that. Oh, we're going to make you pay for it. I mean, I think so, about I think about what we got up to in the eighties and nineties. I mean, I'm never committed a crime, sort of thing. Right. But the way society and what society found acceptable in the eighties and nineties very different. Yeah. Uh, luckily, not everything was on Instagram or Twitter. But I, I that's the other thing is now everything is there and is there. Hey, much look, forever. I remember as a little kid watching black and white TV, and it had the black and white minstrels on it, and that was just TV. So it was like, it was, I saw an interview. I saw an interview in with um, yeah. with Will Smith on like Conan or something like that, and he was talking about. They asked him about his his, his son, you know, Jaden, and all the dumbass stuff he got gets up to. And he's like, you know, and Will Smith says, yeah, he's a dumbass. And he's like, mm-hmm. then again, so was I, but yeah. I didn't have Twitter and Twitter and Facebook to show the world that I was a big dumbass. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it is. It's just a contro- It's just everything's a, a controversy, and and doesn't mean anything ultimately. Most of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, Twitter's. Oh, they're really hounding on Twitter. It was, well, turn off your phone and walk down the street with kids. <laughs> there's what a difference mute, does it make? There's a, but that's sort of always been a part of the culture. Yeah. You know, I walked and worked in Talkback Radio for a long time and we'd get complaints and my response would be, if you don't like my show, then turn it off. go listen to another station. Yeah. You know, television show was offensive. If you don't like the offensive television show, look at another channel. Music for such a long time has been something that's kind of led... Um, I mean, you think about like, you know, Elvis in the 50s sort of thing, breaking new ground. Of, yeah. So it seems that society at the moment is go- not going backwards in a bad way, but if someone tries to put their head up and break new ground, they, they eat their own. Mm-hmm. Is there a danger of, and it's funny, we found these mashups before and Jace had, um, what was the killing of the name of one? We just for some reason we started looking at mashups. It just popped waiting. up on my Facebook feed and it was, I, it was Rage Against the Machine meets Vanessa Kelton's A Thousand Miles. <laughs> yeah, it like, Play it for 10 seconds. Okay, hold on. This is. It's. Um, With Vanessa Kelton in the background. That's hilarious. Sacrilege. That's absolute funny. sacrilege. But like, I'm thinking about this. I mean, could this song be made, produced, and be successful today? I have no idea. I really don't. Something like Rage Against the Machine, you know, because they're like. You know, for their time, they were the like down the with the establishment, but also keeping within the mainstream as well. You know, yeah, they they yeah. they led the way for the mainstream of you know. I think actually one of their videos actually literally has in the video uh, a pro uh, a, a sign that says Trump twenty uh, for two thousand, like a Trump campaign sign two thousand. So a joke in one of their music videos is that Donald Trump is running for president. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and in the Simpsons and all those other places, it's funny what becomes true after a while. Unfortunately, yeah, it is. So um, where to from here? Now, I know that, you, that you've that you got um, commitments to get to and that kind of thing. we have a bit of a drive and a few things we have to do. In yeah, off to Invercargo. Not least of which will be snarfing down a few of those bluffies. Oh, yeah, when you get down there. So what is it? You get to Invercargo, sound check, off to bluff. Yeah, we've got a, yeah, we have another thing to do down there as well. Um, meeting some people. But it, it's um, just one of those beautiful bonuses when you arrive and it's, the season as well. Mm. I, mean, I love those things. How you much oysters in LA? Well, they're expensive. I mean, they're expensive here, aren't they? Yeah. But but you just can't get bluff oysters down there or up there. You wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I did. Get, might be able to, but you'd get food poisoning too. But, well, the last ones we got yeah. actually, there's a guy in Culver City, which is a neighbourhood not far from from where we are, um, um, who's got a, a Kiwi style cafe, seafood cafe called um, Tangaroa. Oh, he's cool. A, he's a Maori guy and oh, cool. from up north, and he. He, we were, uh, mate and I were down there, oh, I guess a few months back, and he came out and he, he knows us a bit because we go in there and he said, oh, hey boys, I've just come back from New Zealand and I've got, uh, I brought back 10 dozen in, in my luggage, you know, obviously, <laughs> and yeah. back, backed up. He said, are you guys interested in something? We're like, you know we are. <laughs> so uh, that was good. They were just fresh off the plane. He'd brought them back direct himself. Um, yeah, so I mean, then we head to Queenstown. We've got a private show there at... The Hills Golf Club on Saturday. So that when Mel you say Parsons, private show, that's they've booked us for a. Um, so they that they look after the guests. They book you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Pay a fee and there we go. And Mel Parsons is on that too, which would be good to see her. And uh, and then we do the Sherwood on 
it's the Sunday night. That's a neat little venue as well, a hotel there on uh, around the lake. And then we head up into Palmy and New Plymouth. Haven't been to either of those places for a long time. Nice. So. Tuesday in Palmy and we're selling tickets. I can't believe it. I love Palmerston North. You do? It's a great little city. Yeah, yeah I haven't I been it. for so long. Um, I, I think the last time I was there was Bo Runger and that lot for that church tour thing that they did. World's best library, I reckon, in Palmerston North. Is that right? Yeah, it's an amazing library. Oh, okay. Um, anyone that you've seen uh, in the Kiwi music scene, people we don't know of that you think, you know, 18 months, everyone's going to know the same. But like, you know, even though 660 has been around for a while, you know, two years ago they were smaller, now they're massive. You seen anyone? Have you kept your eye on anyone that I, you think is up and coming? I, I, I really haven't. Um, I'm sort of out of the loop in a lot of ways. It's so hard to find out what's going on anywhere now in the sense that um, where do you start? Mm. I mean, that's, uh, that, that, that's one of the things that we were talking about this in the van actually with Ben King and Kurt. It's um, how do you find good music these days that you might like or the stuff that's where do you start and that's the thing the gatekeepers were annoying but also you had to get to a certain point before you could get your music out there in, yeah. other, in other words you couldn't sign a, you wouldn't be signed to a record deal unless you had an audience already building so you've gone out and a catalog of songs and a catalog and and you know um you know these days there's a million artists on spotify and and you know, acts that I think are really good, and you you go and you look at it, how many followers, how many plays? Five plays, <laughs> you know, yeah. two followers, and you think, holy shiz. Um, it's just a, it's a different world in that sense. So that means yeah. there are still kind of gatekeepers, because there are still the labels and stuff, but the gatekeepers don't have quite the same sway as they once. That's but then, then you look at, even though she was signed, the lords of this world, um, she was mm -hmm. signed as a young, young mm -hmm. girl, but she basically was releasing her stuff for free. In fact, Royals, I think, was went out for free on SoundCloud, and that's where she started. So she's kind mm -hmm. of, maybe that's the new model, that there is still a gatekeeper, but she does her own stuff. You know, exactly. Um, yeah, it, it, it could go any any number of ways, I suppose. Um, I was, I mean, I, I can't really think of anything more, more um, what's the word? I can't think of a a more tried and true method than just getting your ass out there and playing in front of people and just keep going building an audience getting momentum and that's the tired old analog way probably there's a much better digital way of doing that i just don't know what that might be yeah uh, but that's interesting because you can build an audience online now i mean you look at uh that kiwi artist three or four years ago kelsey whatever her name is who pretended to put a uh, tattoo of um harry styles whatever's on her cheek <laughs> and she got hundred thousand followers it right. was so obviously fake but yeah. That's probably her building an audience, not for her music, but for her personality, and it might grow from there. Yeah, that's right. Does it mean that we're in danger of, uh, like when you had those gatekeepers, you would hope it was always music-led, music first. That's what's important. But now it, you, we're in this age of maybe personality first, music comes second for some people. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because, um, you know, it gets into the whole marketing thing of looks and style and fashion and all that other stuff as well There's so many factors involved with it yeah i'm glad i'm, I'm you know i'm glad i've got what i've got these days i yeah. appreciate it more than i used to in a lot of ways it's not it's a boutique thing it really is and you can maintain it so the whole digital side of that keeps keeps the whole thing running as well cool so yeah. when you when you get back from australia back to the states which will be it looks like uh march april start of april um you got, are you booked up for the next couple of months or do you kind of start again? Uh, I've got um, a couple of projects that are, will be finishing up and I'm actually, um, I'm producing a singer who's, who's rather good, um, Norwegian, Norwegian uh, girl. And um, then I'm starting, I'm writing as well. I've got, I had a recent meeting with Nigel Stone who produced, uh, Kiwi Guy, who produced my Vine Street Stories album back in the day. He's been in London for 20 years working on film and mixing films and, and ADR and all that kind of stuff. And he's keen to get back into music as well. So nice. he's got a studio in London and we'll, we'll probably do the track in Los Angeles somewhere. And maybe we'll bring up Ben King you know, to play the guitar or and find a bunch of people. But so, yeah, I've got a lot of writing to do. And, mm. and you know, also, uh, well, you know, this one of your father's. So I've got a daughter who's six and. Um, my wife's a stunt woman, so she's, oh, wow. she's not working all the time either. But 
between us, we sort of vary. Yeah. What vary. kind of work would we have seen her unknowingly in? Oh, she's on everything. You can look her up if you like. IMDb. Kelly Barksdale on IMDb. And so she just, is she body doubles for people and stuff or more drives cars? Uh, or? Kelly with an I actually, brother. She, she does uh, all kinds of stuff. A lot of kids stuff because she's really, she's really tiny. So she does a lot of kids stunts. Um, oh, really? So she doubles for children? A lot of that. Oh, wow. Yeah. How um, tiny is tiny? Tiny, tiny is 14. Holy moly, that's tiny, she's tiny. Little. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah, look at that. She's, it's easy to say what she hasn't been in, really. Honestly. Is that uh, slow, 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 slow? I want to see was that Wonder Woman the movie? Yeah. Wow. Um Wow. Bird Box, she was in that. Ant Man and the Wasp. Wow. Yeah, there's some big big stuff. A lot there. of stuff. She works all the time. It must be fun. I always used to think It's a lot. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, holy it goes on, doesn't it? That's why I was scrolling. <laughs> Little yeah. fuckers went past there. Bad teacher. I always used to think um it would have been and, and uh, it's a silly example because he will be known, but when Coldplay was big, it would have been nice to be the drummer of Coldplay. <laughs> you know, so you get all the travel, all the concerts, totally. all the money, but who Walk the hell knows who I you are? I wouldn't recognise them now, I don't yeah. think. It must be nice to be involved in that bigger industry. Well, even better, even the, even the drummer of, uh, of, you know, only people people only know the Edge and, and Bono. You could be the bass player and totally. the drummer of U2 and walk down the street. I saw Bono <laughs> I saw Bono the other day in the star spot of the week uh, in Bay City's Deli, which is down the road from us, wonderful deli. Okay. This and is, there he was, and I thought, I went in early, there's not usually packed and it was hardly and I thought is that Bono standing there and I, so, and I, I could see he saw me and you could tell the look in his eye he, he must do this every single person he sees <coughs> is that person going to rush up and be a problem yeah <laughs> no I don't think so yeah he carried on and then I listened for the accent sure enough uh, there he was nice and uh, that, that that part of the world is filled with that kind of I was driving parked my car or driving at the lights the other day and I was sitting there and just a block from where we live and that was bloody Martin Sheen I said, it's Martin Sheen oh, in that wow. car next to us but it's that part of town has got a lot of um, um, post studios. And stuff well, Culver City is big for, for for studios and stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the yeah. whole yeah, that's right. But Santa Monica has a lot of post studios, um, recording studios. They do a lot of um, voiceovers, and I thought, oh, Martin Sheen is probably going there to voice uh, some documentary or something for National well, he's, Geographic. He's got a, he's got a TV know. show that's currently done on Netflix that's set down Santa Monica. So. Right. Oh, well, yeah. I remember interviewing Reese Darby. And, uh, you know, he's done very well for a Kiwi oh, internationally and stuff. And we were talking about this exact same thing. You live in Los Angeles now. You know, mm. what's it like? And he goes, well, it's not much different, actually. He goes, I, there are three fathers in my daughter's class who are higher profile comedians than me. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's a... like, he doesn't get recognized <laughs> at all because there's <laughs> three great. other dads here that are right. well more high profile than him. Yeah, it was pretty fun watching the Concords do their thing. They were so, so great and so on the money, I thought... Um, it was neat to see them just take U.S. comedy by storm. Really. Is there is there still that kind of love of Kiwiness amongst that culture? Because I, I, my understanding again was one of the things that made them successful was the the Kiwiness of it. People just loved it, and like I had friends saying to me, uh, you know, that they'd be carrying their their um, not suitcases, their guitar cases through the restaurant. Oh, sorry airport mm -hmm. restaurant came from must be hungry um and it would we had a kiwi flag and that kind of stuff and they'd be pointed out as do you guys know flight of the concords it was oh, like right I'm literally sure. yeah, that they were connection big. they were big for sure um yeah it is interesting i think the that they took a particular angle on the comedy that people hadn't seen before that self-effacing yeah. stuff that's so kiwi you know and they've but just done another live concert it's I on hbo so. i think yeah, yeah, and you yeah. can i saw it come up that you could pre-order it on Amazon or something like that out. the other day yeah all cool. right hey Greg Johnson this has been amazing it has been a great pleasure mate and yeah. I love what you're doing here it's a cool setup I mean holy I, I know this room is amazing thanks to the uh, our mates at Petri Dish who let us film up in their penthouse yeah. for a while longer there we are is. going to have a permanent studio hopefully by the end of the year so when you come back to Dunedin in the next couple of years Come see us again. Oh, I will, mate. No, I'll just put a bolt we'll on a the chair. door and move in here, I reckon. Yeah, I'd love to. Eh? It'd be great. <laughs> this is going to turn into shared office space as well because that's what the rest of the building is. Is rent still affordable in Dunedin? Um, yeah, how much would a loft in the city be? I, I, well, <laughs> I can tell you because this, this, this loft that we're in is on Airbnb. Right, so this is the penthouse in the Petri Dish building, and on Airbnb, what the, this is, I think, is it six bedrooms? What do you reckon this will cost a night? Ooh. Go and have a guess. Um, thousand bucks yeah six six ninety nine seven hundred bucks a night but you think it can what hold, a deal, it can hold mean, 12 people yeah that's but a deal. general rent um 
in the last two years in Dunedin, the uh, you know the there's nothing like Auckland or Wellington or you know that kind of stuff. But you know the average house price has gone from like three thirty to like four fifty five hundred. It's still up there, which it? is, but it's still comparatively cheap compared to the right. rest of the country. So rent's gone from maybe you'd think you know seventy five eighty bucks a room, which sounds like when I was living in Auckland in the nineties, <laughs> to one hundred and twenty mm. bucks a room. So yeah. you know yeah. three bedroom house will cost you three fifty yeah. to rent sort of thing. Are you going to move? Shit, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so just, just so you know, this weather is every typical, day. Typical, right? Yeah. yeah is, they've got us on an average day. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, Greg that's Johnson. Um, thanks, thanks for, for having coming me, in, man. Mate. It was awesome. Real pleasure.